following program is exclusively produced and distributed by Dick Denman's Double D Productions, Inc., all rights reserved. Hi, Golden Age film fanatics, and welcome to DVD Classics Corner on the Air. My name is Dick Dinman, and our goal is to become your exclusive guide to the very best of the Golden Age classics coming out on DVD. We'll have reviews, breaking news of upcoming releases, plenty of surprise guests, and a special feature devoted to the great Golden Age film composers, which we call Cine Music. So let's turn on the marquee and lights, camera, action. It's time for Dick's Picks, in which I get to shine the spotlight on one of my Dick's Picks of the Week. Classic film fans on Blu-ray must be jumping with joy, because the great news is that the Warner Archive engine is back full steam with six, yes, I said six, fantastic classic releases this month, and they are Greta Garbo and Robert Taylor, together and terrific in director George Kuker's masterwork, Camille, Esther Williams and Red Skelton in the Technicolor Aqua Classic, Neptune's Daughter, Joan Crawford and Sidney Greenstreet duke it out on Flamingo Road, Susan Hayward's Oscar-nominated performance in the riveting I'll Cry Tomorrow, Marilyn Monroe versus Laurence Olivier in the sumptuous Technicolor romance The Prince and the Showgirl, and finally the great Edward G. Robinson in the very first Hollywood film to expose the treachery and deceit of Nazi Germany, Confessions of a Nazi Spy. These six Warner Archive classics are now available on Blu-ray, looking and sounding better than they ever have before, even as we speak. Stay tuned for more Dick's Picks, coming up on DVD Classics Corner on the Air very soon. And it's my great pleasure to welcome back to the show Warner Brothers Discovery Library historian George Feltenstein as we share our delight at these six just-released Warner Archive Blu-ray classic releases. George Feltenstein, welcome back to DVD Classics Corner, and the Warner Archive is back in action with six titles this month, all of which I'm looking forward to uh, to chat about with you. Welcome back. Well, well thank you, and, and indeed our robust release schedule is back. At the end of this show, we'll be previewing... Uh, your next month's schedule, which is, in a word, spectacular. But let's get back to this uh, month's six releases, and I'm, I'm over the, the top as far as all of these are concerned, but let us start with Camille. Greta Garbo loves Robert Taylor. Now, how do you feel about the film? Uh, it's one of my favorite Garbo films. I think it may be her best performance or like tied with one or two others as her best. Um, it's, it's a remarkable film, and I think one of the things that makes it special, it's the first time that she worked with George Cukor. Yeah. And I happen to be a big supporter of most of Q Gore's films mm -hmm. because most of them were just magnificent. Right. I mean his 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 track record for excellence is pretty hard to beat. 
Yes. And this is MGM excellence at its most opulent and refreshing. The casting is superb. The whole production is just handled so wonderfully well. And it's faithful to the source material, but the performance that he brings out, not just in Garbo, but of course, in Robert Taylor, this is really his first big dramatic costume picture at MGM. Mm -hmm. And it was a perfect match between the two of them. Yeah. And then I also think Lionel Barrymore's performance is incredibly impressive. Yes. Yeah. As is Henry Daniel. Oh, yes. Very much so. Very much I mean, so. Everybody in the film is just Tremendous. Well, I have no but hesitation. I have no hesitation in, in, in saying what I feel, and that's that this is, I believe, Garbo's finest performance. It is virtually flawless. It's my favorite Garbo performance, though I would put Ninochka <laughs> pretty close to, uh, to that. Congratulations on this wonderful transfer, George. Well, thank you. It was a lot of work and very challenging. The net result of it is uh, a wonderful Blu-ray presentation, far better than we could have anticipated. Let's move on, George, to a film called I'll Cry Tomorrow with Susan Hayward's Oscar-nominated performance. Um, this may be an overreach, but in my humble opinion, this is probably the most powerful film about alcoholism that I've ever seen. Uh, I did watch a few months ago, Lost Weekend, and frankly, it really doesn't hold up that well. But I'll Cry Tomorrow is another story altogether. This is powerful, powerful filmmaking from MGM, no less. And uh, some of it just... I, I, I was shocked at the, the realistic portrayals uh, in this film and how uh, uncompromising it was. Would you guess who my favorite performer in I'll Cry Tomorrow is? I'm going to have to guess that it's Susan Hayward, but I think you're going to tell me that it's Joe Van Fleet. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> See, I know you too well, Dick. <laughs> yeah. That's a good thing. Well, this is not uh, a dig on Susan Hayward, who is magnificent in the role. She, As far as I'm concerned, she might just as well have won two Oscars for this and... I Want to Live, which she did win for. She is absolutely remarkable. She gets totally lost in this role. And for a glamorous actress to let herself go on screen to that level, I think takes a certain amount of courage. But I was watching Joe Van Fleet, and I watched her scenes over and over again because... I kept looking, are there any seconds when she's not involved? Is there anything that, and it's a flawless performance. The way she listens, the way she reacts as uh, the Susan Hayward character, Lillian Roth, gets further down and down and down. It, to me, it's... I mean, this is what acting is all like, and the scenes between the two of them are absolutely heart-rending. And it doesn't hurt. This, this is yet another great, great transfer from you guys. Uh, I well, it's right off the camera negative. It yeah. doesn't get better than that. <laughs> no, it doesn't. It doesn't. So congratulations on, uh, uh, on that, George. I have a feeling you're as impressed with this film as I am. Oh, without question. And, uh, you know, the, the importance of, again, not taking anything away from Susan Hayward, it's her film, 
and she is magnificent in it. And sadly, she had a much closer relationship to the problems of Lillian Roth in her real life than I was aware of when I first saw this movie. It's only been in recent years that I've learned of Susan Hayward's own battle with alcoholism. I did not know that. Oh, yeah. I didn't know it either. She had personal struggles that didn't make the headlines the way other people's did. Yeah. And uh, she did struggle with alcohol tremendously. So Well, that uh, makes me all the more impressed with yeah, her but, totally allowing herself to go full tilt in this this magnificent performance. This is a great film. It's not uh, as well remembered as it should be, but uh, as I said previously, I think it far surpasses Lost Weekend. Let's talk just a little bit about Flamingo Road. Now, I enjoyed this tremendously. It's, it's about a carnival girl played by Joan Crawford trying to find respectability in a town run by a monstrously corrupt Sydney Green Street. Indeed. Now, I have to tell you, not many, not many can share a Crawford movie or give her a run for her money. I think John Garfield did it previously. In this particular case, in the case of Flamingo Road, Sidney Green Street, who does not look well, in fact, this was his last film. Yes, I was about to say that. Other yeah. than uh, a, a, like a 30-second appearance in It's a Great Feeling. Right. And Green Street <laughs> is so overpowering that you can see Crawford straining and it, it's it's just it's the battle of the titans to watch that scene on the porch between Green Street and Crawford is is movie heaven as far as I'm concerned I love this movie I think it's great uh, Zachary Scott is good he took off his mustache so, so he could play weak and uh, David, I think this may be David Bryan's first, uh, one of his first movies uh, at Warner's. It's Crawford at her feistiest, for me, given, <laughs> given a run for her money by an unwaveringly evil, corrupt Sidney Greenstreet. What fun. Is well, what this film does, it brings... Michael Curtiz and Joan Crawford together again for the first time after Mildred Pierce. Yeah, yeah. And Crawford was really on a cycle of, of knockout films yeah. with Mildred Pierce followed by Humoresque, as you mentioned, followed by Possessed, and then Flamingo Road, and then what I consider to be the last of her great films at Warner Brothers. She did few after that weren't so great, but she was always 100% committed to the material no matter what. Yeah. But the last of the really great ones was The Damn Don't Cry. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, Flamingo Road in particular just has all those Warner elements, great supporting cast. It was uh, a very astute adaptation of saucy literary material they got around the code uh, but you had Jerry Wald and Michael Curtiz really giving a spotlight to Crawford and um, you know she had this whole string of really A-level properties and this film remained you know one of her most popular uh, for years to come and even now when we announced that this was coming out People were really thrilled. Now let's go on to the next one, which is a gorgeous Technicolor restoration of the Esther Williams Aqua Spectacle, Neptune's Daughter. Indeed. And it looks wonderful. It, I mean, it really, it really does. But I have a question for you. 
the hit theme song, not theme song, the hit song in Neptune's Daughter. Won the, I believe it won the Oscars, the best song yes, of the year. Yeah. Baby, it's cold outside. Now, let's assume that the Red Skelton Betty Garrett reprise was not in the film. Right. Would you have been able to release this film, or would the Blue Noses or the Sob Sobbing Sisters have said no? It's a terrible song. You can't release it. Uh, well, you know, our, our current cancel culture mentality <laughs> did uh, infect people's opinion of this song, you know, for 70 years or so. It was just fine. And all of a sudden, it's verboten. Yeah. You know, uh, that... that that bubbled up and then thankfully died because uh, it's just ridiculous, frankly. Yeah. Now, yeah. what's interesting that you, you say that is that you can hear in the underscoring another Frank Lesser song, mm -hmm. which is uh, Slow Boat to China. Yeah, that, <laughs> right. And Esther told me herself that they were not allowed to use that song. The MGM censors said, no, that's too uh, over the top and implying I'd like to get you, get you, on a slow boat to China. And this was in and, 1949? Right. And she said to me that you know, that was going to be one of the main songs in the picture, and they weren't going to allow it. Be and, and Esther was explaining this to me, <laughs> you know. And I said, I'm, I'm really shocked that anybody would think that that had any, you know, it, it, it seemed so innocent to me, and yet she was sharing with me yeah. uh, things that I've seen since then in going through uh, the production files for Neptune's Daughter, as we were preparing the release, I always do further research. And I, I saw the memo saying, we, we cannot accept this song from Lesser. The lyrics are too, uh, you know, they're too su suggestive. But they still, in their deal with Frank Lesser, they did use the melody as underscore. Yeah, part of the delight a very big del a part of the delight of Neptune's Daughter, which many, justifiably, I think, consider one of uh, Esther's best, uh, best uh, pictures. I think we have to pay tribute to Red Skelton. And for me, Betty Garrett, who has so much zip, she energizes the proceedings with her wit and her her timing and uh, I, I, I I knew Betty Garrett quite well she was a wonderful wonderful lady and to see her here and I think this may be her last MGM film before her husband Larry Parks was blacklisted and she was gray listed I yeah, I think you're right. I don't know the production schedules. It might have been on the town because that was released literally on either December 30th or 31st, 1949. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why sometimes you see on the town referred to as a 1950 movie. Yeah. But, um, you know, I don't know wh which came. I'm assuming Neptune's daughter. I haven't checked this. It's easy to check it on IMDb, but my brain isn't giving you the an instant answer that usually happens. But I believe Neptune's Daughter was completed first, and then On the Town was the last. Right, uh, right. But I, but I could be wrong. The main point you made, and it's a very, very good one, is she was a bundle of dynamite on the screen. She was adorable. She was funny. She had a really great voice, and the fact that her career was basically eviscerated with the blacklisting of her husband, 
is a, is a heartbreaking thing, and I think it killed Larry Parks because he died so young. Oh, sure. George, we're going to go to a quick station break. Okay. And, uh, after which, we'll be back with two more great Warner Archive releases. <laughs> Now for station identification. DVD Classics Corner on the Air is exclusively produced and released by Dick Denman's Double D Productions, Inc. All rights reserved. And we're back with George Feltenstein, and George, I want to talk about Confessions of a Nazi Spy. This is a remarkable film. It, two and a half years before World War II, Warner Brothers made this film, which tells it like it is. It's, it, the courage of the Warner Brothers, to me, is so admirable. Especially, I mean, it names Nazis, and and it it it's it condemns an entire country's culture, which it it should. But no other studio did that during the '30s at all. They were literally in bed with uh, Germany. They had a, a German uh, a consulate person who, su right. who supervised everything. And, and, and then I thought when watching this film, which, which is such, such a blunt and explosive expose of Nazi spying, then I remembered another remarkable film, a year, it would came out a year later in June 1940, The Mortal Storm from MGM, which Right, is, another film that we released on Blu-ray not that long ago. Yes, it is, a, that too is a powerful film. However, they still will not use the words Nazi, and God forbid they should use the word Jew or Jewish. So, it... it in a way, it's kind of a, it doesn't have the courage that that the Warners had, and I can understand why many members, uh, the, uh, individuals who contributed to the making of this film, did not take credit, including Max Steiner. Uh, yes, obviously. and there's no credited producer, if you notice in the credits. Right, and the credits come at the end, and. Many actors' names in smaller roles uh, are actually not the real actors' uh, names. Yeah. Um, there were several more prominent performers, including Marlena Dietrich and Anna Sten, who were offered roles and turned them down because they feared for their relatives yeah. who were still in Europe. Yeah. And this was... We've been talking about this film so much here at Warner Brothers in recent times, uh, not just because we have this new 4K scan of the negative and a Blu-ray release. I mean, that is enough. And it's also, I thought it was integral to be available in a beautiful release to tie in with our company's 100 years of history as we're about to celebrate our 100th birthday on April 4th. By the time your program goes live, that date will have passed, but it's a year-long celebration. And releasing this film was so important because the, studio, the Warner Brothers themselves, with most of them, with the exception of Jack, I think, uh, being uh, immigrants, 
Jack was born in Canada after the family had immigrated. They immigrated to the United States, then went up to Canada. Jack was born while they were there, and then they came back to the U.S. But um, the Warner Brothers themselves had such a love for this country and for freedom after the tyranny they had suffered in Eastern Europe and they celebrated our country, and they celebrated freedom, and they spoke out against fascism and the horrible things that were obviously happening in Europe that most people were turning a blind eye to. And it's very telling that Warner Brothers, as I'm, as I understand it, closed its German offices around 1934, sh shortly after Hitler came to power. Um, and all the other studios closed their German offices on December 8, 1941, the day after Pearl Harbor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, every other studio, as I understand it, you know, I certainly wasn't around, so I can't tell you for sure, but as I understand it, every other studio was still operating in Germany until the very last minute. Absolutely. And our release of Confessions of a Nazi Spy has something a little unusual, and that is that we have text cards that are basically an essay about the film's production history and how it came to be. And then we have an ample quote from Harry Warner's testimony to a Senate subcommittee that was exploring the potential propaganda in Hollywood films. And the senator who was one of the key people or possibly the key person involved in that uh in those hearings was a senator named Gerald Nye. And Harry Warner was giving his testimony because they were accusing the Warner Brothers of making propaganda films like this. And included in that list of propaganda films was Sergeant York. <laughs> I mean, that's how ridiculous this was. Yeah. And Harry Warner was defending what they were doing and furthermore, speaking of the love he and his brothers had for this country and how much they appreciated freedom and the calling out the threat of fascism and hatred and uh, bigotry, mm -hmm. uh, they had been doing that with a lot of films before Confessions of a Nazi Spy, like Life of Emil Zola, yeah. or uh, even Juarez, you know, showing other situations where there was oppression and then freedom. Yeah. Uh, Confessions of a Nazi Spy dealt with the reality head on. And when the film was shown to the Senator Nye in 1939, he told a Warner Brothers uh, uh, branch manager or chief or some high publicity person, uh, this is a magnificent film, I'm paraphrasing, uh, every patriotic American should see this and be aware of these issues that threaten our democracy. And two years later, that same senator was grilling all the Hollywood moguls, and when Harry Warner was giving his testimony, he quoted Senator Nye's uh, telegram from two years earlier when the film was released, because this testimony was in September of 1941. And he gave the senator who was grilling him a quote of his own, which undermined the grilling they were doing to Harry. 
yeah. and uh, kind of set the guy up like a clam. <laughs> and, of course, uh, I've read through all of those hearing uh, notes and testimonies and everything um, because it is so frightening to see what happens when people get into a high level of government and start to threaten freedom in our democracy and everything on which our cu- country is based yeah. for free speech and all the things that we hold dear. And those same things are now possibly threatened. And so that's why looking at a movie from 84 years ago being so prescient is kind of staggering. And knowing the context, I said, we cannot release this film on Blu-ray without providing historical context. And that's why we added this text essay and Harry Warner's uh, testimony quote as an extra on the disc. We have to move on to the last title. The okay. Prince, the Prince and the Showgirl. <laughs> now, I, I hesitate to say that this is the most gorgeous transfer <laughs> on Blu-ray I've ever seen because, obviously, sometime in the future, like next month, <laughs> there's going to be something that's equal, and I'm sure that, uh, all of your releases look and sounds so great that it's hard to go out on a limb. But I'm telling you, I almost fell off my chair when Prince and the Showgirl uh, uh, began. It is gorgeous beyond anything I've seen in, in a long time. This is a magnificent transfer. So congratulations on that. But I have a theory about this film, which co-stars Marilyn Monroe and Laurence Olivier, and I really wonder whether you will agree with this theory. And you know, I'm sure, all about the terrible, torturous shooting schedule, right? Mm-hmm. Well... Olivier, who was originally enchanted by Marilyn Monroe, grew more and more irate at her lateness, at uh, her inability to take direction, to, to move correctly, to, 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 to say the lines correctly. The, uh, the, the cast and crew ended up disliking her intensely. It was a torturous shoot. But for me, something funny happened on the way to the forum. When I look at this film, I'm looking at Marilyn, not Olivia, and it almost see, seems to me like she's so natural, so natural, that she, she somehow makes Olivier look artificial. <laughs> I would agree with you on that, absolutely. Yeah. It, it's it's remarkable, all of that uh, gashrai, all of those problems, and she emerges. I mean, I think this probably this is her best performance. I I like her better in this than I did in Bus Stop, uh, and The Misfits, uh, and uh, I'm amazed they were even able to get her to say those reams of Terence Radigan lines with such. Uh, apparent ease. She never loses con- control on film, at least. She comes across as totally natural. I've never been a Monroe fan, but I think I'm going to have to r- take a look at, at her films again after this, because I, frankly, was very impressed with her. And that that's my feeling about well, I think, the, you know, the film has always been popular, and 
you know, it represents a little bit of a different Marilyn Monroe because she kind of had to take a little bit of a break from 20th Century Fox and what she was doing there. Um, and she wanted to strike out on her own, and she went to New York. She joined the Actors Studio. She, uh, you know, had made big changes in her life because she wanted to be taken seriously as an actress. And she formed her own production company and made a deal with Warner Brothers to make this film. They shot it overseas in at Pinewood in 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 London. Uh, and that was really kind of at Olivier's uh, request. And Olivier, you know, did have some kind of co-production involvement, but was the director and... It was kind of, uh, she had Marilyn Monroe Productions, but you'll notice in the credits it says a, a Marilyn Monroe Production dash LOP, which stands for Lawrence Olivier Pictures yeah. Yeah. Production. So he was involved in that way too, and Warner Brothers happily provided the financing, and there, there's even a picture that, uh, we've been, uh, promoting around of Jack Warner giving Marilyn, the key to the Warner Brothers lot, you know, <laughs> for publicity. And Milton Green, who was her photographer, is credited as the executive producer of the film because he was helping to be there for emotional support. Yeah. And, um, you know, the whole thing turned out really well. But my fear was I had never seen this film look good. This film always looked washed out. Mm -hmm faded, the DVD was in the wrong aspect ratio, it just looked really terrible, to be honest. And I, I assumed that, that the original negative, because it was Eastman Color Stock from 1957, that is the period of time when we find camera negatives where the fade is just beyond... Uh, rec reclamation, and we often have to go to the second generation protection se separation masters to recreate the color and rebuild the color. Uh, but that takes you a generation away. I don't know if it had anything to do with the water in the chemicals in the lab in London, but this camera negative had so much robust color in it. It almost looks like three-strip Technicolor. Yes, it does. We were shocked and delighted, and it, it just is astoundingly beautiful, and part of that you have to attribute to the cinematographer, the great Jack Cardiff. Indeed. Who, you know, we've, we've spoken about before because his work is just amazing. Um, but... Everything here comes together in a charming film, and uh, we're already in the second repressing of the disc, and it's only been available for about, as we record this, about two and a half weeks. Mm. Um, and that's how fervent the orders have been, and I expect it will continue. Before we go, I have to quickly say, because we are running out of time, coming up is... William Powell, K. Francis in One Way Passage, William Wellman's Safe in Hell, which I've never seen, Storm Warning, a riveting film about the Ku Klux Klan with Ginger Rogers, Ronald Reagan, Doris Day, and Steve Cochran, two James Cagney fantastic films, A Lion in the Streets, which is in, I think, Technicolor. It's not yet worn. Yes, indeed. Yeah, in Technicolor. And... Robust. And my possible favorite Cagney film, Strawberry Blonde. So, congratulations, George. I'm so thrilled, as are all of your numerous fans, that the Warner Archive is bouncing back with full vigor, and I just can't wait for the announcements coming up later this year. I'm sure they'll be equally fantastic. Well, 
We aim to please, as Popeye would say. <laughs> and uh, we, we continue to have new exciting announcements, and there's going to be more coming shortly and coming monthly. And uh, we thank all the fans for their continued support. And most importantly, Dick, I thank you for your support of our efforts. And it's always such a pleasure to be on your program. And such a pleasure to have you on the program. Uh, as we know, you uh, I think this is now 48th or 49th, uh, your 48th or 49th appearance. So, wow, yeah, I did not know that. <laughs> it won't, well, we're talking since, uh, what, since 2005, I think? And that would make sense, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And again, congratulations, George, and can't wait till the next time. Well, I feel the same way. Thank you so much. <laughs> Well, that's my show for today. DVD Classics Corner on the Air is conceived, written, produced, and directed by me, Double D. And if you'd like to hear some of my older, vintage shows, please go to www.dvdclassicscorner.net, where in addition to the broadcasts, you'll find hundreds of my print reviews of classic DVD releases. So, until next week... Keep well, keep happy, and... Keep listening.